So today we're going to be talking in Ephesians. We're still doing our study on Ephesians. Today the message is entitled, A New Way to Walk. A New Way to Walk. So turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to be beginning with verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And we're going to be reading through verse 24. Page is turning. Because you know what? What the Bible says is far more important than what I have to say. So hopefully you read the scripture and if I don't hit it right, the Holy Spirit hopefully will hit you with it right anyway. The Bible tells us that His Word will not return to Him void. So therefore, whatever we read from the Word is worth reading from the Word. That's why it's important for us to read the Word every day. Something from the Word because the Word is powerful. It's more powerful than anything that any man could ever say it has, the, it has the words of life, and it has the words of death. So let's read Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 17. And Paul's writing, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work on uncleanness with greediness, but, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard... Hear, I'm sorry. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is a corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, and after which God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Sometimes my contacts mess me up. <laughs> I can't focus. In a book entitled Waking the Dead, John Eldridge stated this, We have to choose to live from the new heart, and our old nature doesn't go down without a fight. We have to learn to live with our new heart, but that old nature doesn't go down without a fight. Don't you agree with that today? I think Paul struggled with that, and if Paul struggled with it, certainly we're going to struggle with it too. Now, so far we've seen in Ephesians that God always had a plan. It wasn't an accident. It was a plan. He laid the foundation of the world to send His... Before the foundation of the world, He sent His Son. It was a plan. It wasn't an accident. God didn't say, uh-oh, now what do I do? Before the world was ever created, He knew everything. Because God can't be God if He doesn't know everything. When Jesus departed uh, from this world... He became our advocate with the Father. And then He sent His Holy Spirit. We learned that in Ephesians, if we didn't know it already. This engrafting of the Holy Spirit into the believer changes the person forever. You understand? Well, I think Brother Allen was trying to get all over my message this morning. I said, Brother Allen, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate the emphasis. <laughs> Talking about the way we walk. You can't walk the right road if you don't have the right thing in you. But if you have the right thing in you, you'll walk the right road. The Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. So you can't walk the wrong way without Him putting His thumb on you. Now the Bible does tell us that some sleep because they don't obey God. So that's enough. You're done. Some people sleep. But God wants us to follow Him. The Holy Spirit changes us. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I tell you, your DNA structure is changed. I have a message on DNA structure. You can go to DNA. You can go to look on our website. and they've got it. I don't remember the name of it, but it's in there somewhere. <laughs> Point is, God changes our DNA. How do we know? Because, you know, if you have people that you, you look at somebody and say, well, you know, you got the characteristics of your daddy. My people say to my daughter, you're just like your daddy. You know, I can see David Barber, and you tell her that all the time. I say, well, I hope that's not a bad thing. <laughs> Sometimes they don't mean it as a compliment. <laughs> but you know what I mean? We have our DNA from our parents, don't we? 
Some of their characteristics, some of it, some of it's nurture and some of it's nature, isn't it? But there is DNA that does have a factor on you. Um, your intelligence is a lot determined by the by uh, DNA. Um, I didn't say you're smart because there's some people that don't have as high IQ but are smarter than others because they use what they're given. I've always said that about myself. I'm not the most intelligent guy, but I'm very smart. I use a little bit I got. I strain every bit of it out. <laughs> uh, but we see if you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and changes you. The Bible says you're a new creature. What does that mean? That means your DNA has changed because your DNA determines who you are. So therefore, the Bible tells us our DNA has changed because you're a new creature. If your DNA didn't change, you're the same creature. All these people out there that's worried about this, whether a man can be a woman, a woman can be a man, which we know it can't be because they can't change the creature. Their DNA is still the same. They're not a new creature. They're just a perverted creature. You understand? But when we're saved, we become a new creature. Our last message in Revelation, Ephesians, in chapter 4, we talked about, in verses 1 through 3, we talked about it. Paul talked about our calling, salvation by grace. In verse 3 through 6, he talked about our unity of the body. In verse 7 through 10, he talked about our unique gifting of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then in verse 11 through 16, our being built up through the ministries of those gifted individuals that God gives gifts to everybody. Every Christian in here has at least one God-given gift. It means God specially enabled you. And what is a gift? Something you didn't ask for. Now, can you ask for gifts? The Bible does tell us we can ask for the better. We can ask, but God has to be the one that gives it. I know some people that would love to have the, the well, there's a difference in a talent and a gift, so I don't get involved in that. I was going to say gift of singing, but singing is not a gift. Singing is a talent. <laughs> and there's a difference. We'll cover that one day. But the point is, but some people might want to be able to sing. Well, you know what? You can want to sing all you want to. Some people just can't. No matter what you do, you just can't do it. My daddy could not carry a tune. In a bucket. Could not, but he would try. Just don't stand next to him while he's trying. <laughs> but he enjoys singing. He loved to sing. I love to see him singing. I love to hear my daddy singing. He's going to be with the Lord now. I love to hear him singing when he was out there by himself. Okay, he didn't bother nobody, but he's out there singing away. Uh, I assure you he can sing today. He's got perfect harmony today. Um, God has given us a Savior he gave us a way to be redeemed by the Savior, His Holy Spirit to change the believer into a new creature, and then He gave gifts to the church to use to build the church of God. Now that's not just Watson Grove, that's kingdom building. You understand the difference? Some people want to build their churches, and I heard somebody say this the other day, talking about that, that a lot of people want to build churches by, doing, by moving chess pieces around. They want to steal somebody. I saw this thing on the, uh, I was watching, I'm a YouTuber. I was watching this thing on YouTube about this guy talking about, this guy was complaining because uh, he found that this guy came to the church to tell them how to market their church. And one of the things that they talked about was how to do geofencing. You might hear geofencing. I haven't really, I've heard it in different forms. I apply drones, so I know geofencing for drones. They can't let you get into certain areas. But uh, this is geofencing social-wise. And what it is is if you're a member of a church and you go into another area, they know you're a member of the church because they, got, they, you know, they have records of your tax giving or whatever. And because of that, they can actually identify that you're a member of a different church and they can send you stuff from a different church inviting you to their church. Deliberately targeting church people to go to a different church. And what they say is you have a ready-made tithing organization because these people already tithe. <laughs> That's un unethical, isn't it? But we're not into that. We're into building the kingdom of God. We want people to go to the church where they need to go to that preaches the word. I don't care which church you go to. When we're out there ministering people online today, those of you out there listening to us, I hope you're going to church somewhere. hope you're listening to us because you're unable to go to today, not because you don't want to go today. The church body is where you should be. I don't want to harp on that too long. But God gives gifts to the church. Uh, given that those gifts, Christians should walk differently than those who have not got the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? Matter of fact, I would dare say you that they will walk differently. 
Paul says that uh, they have been transformed and are being transformed. You know, you have, uh, there are several things on um, um, sanctification has three phases. I heard this over and over again. Sanctification has three phases. There's positional sanctification. As soon as you're saved, you're a saint of God. You don't have to earn it. It's automatic. You're a new creature. You're a saint. So when the Bible talks about the saints and you're a Christian, they're talking about you. It's not one of the things that the Catholic Church has to do verify that you did a miracle, which we know they didn't do. But the point is, it's not about that. It's about automatically, if you're a Christian, you're a saint. All Christians are saints, sanctified because they're, the Holy Spirit comes upon them positionally. Then as we go through our lives, we have what's called progressive sanctification. Because we work more and more allowing ourselves to be less and Him to be more. Because guess what? When you get the Holy Spirit, you got them all. He's a person. You don't get a leg and an arm today, a leg tomorrow, a, you know, a hand. No. you got all of Him with all of His abilities. Think about it now. You're a kid in a candy store with all the candy. And all you want to do is go to the gumball. But you can get so much more. Because you got it all. You own the whole store. You got it all, but you got to know how to reach up there. Sometimes you got to get a stepladder, reach up to get it. Sometimes you got to get somebody to open the door to let you in because you don't know how to get there. Point is, the Holy Spirit's all, but progressively over time, you got to empty out yourself. Your cup's full, but it's full of stuff you don't need. You got to empty that cup out so you can fill it back up. You know, I like to drink coffee every day. But if I put too much coffee in there, I ain't got no room for my creamer. And then i got to pour out some of that coffee because I'm going to put some creamer in there, okay? You know what I'm saying? The cup, the cup will only hold so much. Well, guess what? Your spiritual life will only hold so much. If it's more of you, it's going to be less of him. So progressive sanctification takes place. But when we get to heaven, we have perfect sanctification. Because now we've got no more sin. We've got perfect sanctification. See, so he said being transformed, but also we have been transformed or being transformed. So the question is, how do we reconcile that one-time event of transformation with that continual process of transformation? Look at verse 17 of our reading today. He said, therefore. And when you read a Bible, when the verse starts off with therefore, it means that you look, stop and see what it's there for. What is it there for? It's there for what you just got through talking about, right? Therefore. And by the way, that's an important Bible truth. When you study the Bible, anytime it says therefore, that means it's there for a reason. Something else happened. It's backwards focused. See, Paul wants them to back up to what he just taught them about the high calling of Jesus in their lives. Uh, because we've given all the benefits that's mentioned in verse 1 through 16. We're not to be like the lost pagan in this world. Churches today, I am ashamed of many, are you not? that put the name of Jesus on their buildings, how horrible. Men who proclaim to be, uh, men and women now, and it's. So now you can have transgender pastors in some places. The world we live in, guess why you cannot have a transgender pastor? You may have someone stand before a group of people, they call a church, with someone who claims to be something that they're not. How do I know that? Because that's anti-God, and anything anti-God is not godly. Therefore, God has no part of it. Let's stop calling something right when it's wrong. Let's stand up. Uh, uh, Alan, again, talked about this morning in Sunday school. we got to tell people when they're wrong. You know, homosexuality is wrong. Let me tell you, homosexuality is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. Now, it's no more sin than any other sin, though, so let's not pick and choose. Lying is a sin, yes. Homosexuality is a sin, yes. Hold on. Homosexuality is worse than lying. In God's eyes, sin is sin. Don't pick out the sin you want to harp on. But let's don't say that it's okay, because I don't think any of us would say that lying is okay. But there's plenty out there in the church that would say homosexuality is okay. And that's the problem, isn't it? Because that's not of God. I'm on that line. But. So today we're going to continue our series. We're going to look at uh, a new way to walk. Our new walk, uh, our walk is new because it's different from the world. Our walk is new today because it's disconnected from the world. And our walk today is new because it's deliberate 
from the world. So the first thing we'll look at is our walk is new because it's different from the world. I mean, we who are saved are changed. We are no longer who we were. I told you this, folks, when I got saved at 10 years old at the uh, at a Evangelical Methodist Church in Kannapolis, North Carolina. After I got saved, I walked out in the parking lot and one of the guys that had gone up with me at the same time, a couple of years old, I was 10 years old, a couple of guys, a guy was 12 years old outside in the parking lot, he's out there using profanity, cussing. I said, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? I said, you just got saved. He said, that don't mean nothing. I said, well, it meant something to me. See, I got it and he didn't. You understand? I knew the difference. And we as Christians, we know or don't know. We are different. Christians are saved. We are different. We're no longer. We said that verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. We are new. If you got saved and you don't feel any different than you did before you got saved, you probably didn't get saved. And guess what? A lot of times it makes you feel worse about yourself than better. What? That's right, because now I see my sin. Before I hid from my sin, I was living in that hot water and I didn't know the water was hot. But once I got that cool, freshing water of the Holy Spirit, I felt the heat of the water, didn't you? I don't want to stay in that boiling tub like the frog does that boil and stays in there to boil up. I want to get out. I don't want to put my toe in that water anymore. Because when I do it, when, I, when you do it, it scalds you, don't it? You hope? Or do you live in that tempid area where, you know, you just don't feel anything anymore? I'm afraid to say many Christians have gone that way because they've allowed life to do that. As a result of new birth, we're not what we used to be. We can no longer live like we used to live. We've been changed and we're different from the world around us. Paul in this passage, gives us three specific problems that plague the lost. Three problems that plague the lost. The first problem we see in verse 17. I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Christians walk in the vanity of their mind. See, Paul says that they walk in the vanity of their mind. It means futility, emptiness, that which wasted on nothing. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. That's what Solomon said. You can be the greatest, the most richest person in the world and when you open your eyes in hell, it was worth nothing. It was worth nothing. What you do in this lifetime is important. People ask me oftentimes, and I'm not an example for others. I don't try to be. I hope Jesus is an example to others. But I have people ask me, David, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And I got a long list of things that I do. And they say, well, when are you going to take a break? And my answer, not being facetious, is when I'm dead. You know, or when God won't let me do any more. The deal is I can only do what I can do. I want to squeeze out of this life every ounce of what I can do because that's what God put me here for doing. You know what I mean? That's what he put me here to do, to squeeze every ounce out of it. Now, I wish I was squeezing it all out. It was all good. Because some of that I'm squeezing is probably wasted time and not doing what God needs me to do because I'm spending on worldly things. Aren't you? I can take a vacation when I'm done. My wife wants me to take one before then. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with taking vacations, folks. I don't mean that at all. Bible like Jesus said, come ye apart and rest a while. So he, he was in favor of vacations too. Lost people live empty lives because their minds are corrupted by the sin that dwells within them. They don't know what they don't know. Thus, every thought is corrupted by evil. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continuously. Mankind only has the thoughts for evil. People say, well, cannot bad people do good things? You know? Can bad people do good things? The Bible says they can, but they're always thinking evil. 
Well, they say even a blind squirrel gets a nut once in a while. But why are they doing the good thing? To make themselves feel better? Then they're doing it for the wrong reason, aren't they? They're doing it for selfish reasons. You know, these, all these millionaires who give money to the poor because they feel guilty. <laughs> That's what it is. Not necessarily because they care about the poor. I always worry about, I really don't worry about the rich people. I don't. I don't know many of them. I don't hang in that circle. I know a lot of poor people. I'm afraid I hang in that circle. <laughs> Not as poor as some, though. But, you know, the, the, the deal is uh, uh, the, the, the rich people, uh, if they aren't careful, they're focused on the wrong thing. And they spend their lives uh, focused on getting more and more and more and more. And then they have less and less and less and less. The more they have, the less they have. And it's sad. So we should have empathy for those people. The mind of the lost invents ways to serve the flesh or the selfish desires of the mind. The lost mind events. They invent false gods. They invent false religions. And by the way, many of them are called Christian religions today. Mormonism is a fake religion. Yet people consider it part of the Christian religion. It's not at all. Go look at the theology. It's not, it's not right at all. I mean, we know that. There's others. I have a list going on. I'm not gonna make a day. I'm not gonna make the day of, of slamming everybody today. But you ask me, I'll tell you who they are. Um, how did they get started? Were they built upon godly men and women who believed in the word of God and stood true, or were they started by fake things of people having some type of a of a, a new revelation from God? If it starts automatically, well, God told so and so these doctrines. I would say. Throw that in the trash. Because if it don't come out of this book, if this don't where it start at, that ain't where it's going to finish at. False imagination, false religion, foolish philosophies. These are inventions of the lost man. They provide nothing that's going to help you. In the end, nothing. They ultimately lead to damning of the soul. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the way there are is of death. Paul tells us in Romans that the lost possess a retro, reprobate mind. 128 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Reprobate means depraved mind. Don't we live in a world of depraved-minded people? And a lot of them are a lot of them are in office today. A lot of them are running for the highest office in the land. And the battle is whether they'll get it or not. Isn't that terrible that our country is to that state where people with retrobate minds is doing the things that are ungodly, have the greatest chance, when I have great opportunities to lead the nation of America that's founded on the Christian faith. And yes, we were founded on Christian faith. The word here refers to, describes metal that was tested and rejected by refiners because they were too impure. These people's minds are too impure. The word came to mean useless and worthless. These people's thinking is what I call stinking thinking. Their thinking is thinking. There's no good in what they think and what they say. And yet you see many people following them. Remember the Bible tells us that broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that find it. Because we're saved, we're different though. Romans 2, 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See, God transforms through the Holy Spirit our minds prog uh, progressively. Paul tells us the world has a problem with their head, then he moves to the heart. In verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Blindness means stubbornness. They're blind. They can't see the truth because they don't want to see the truth. You know, how do these people, people that talk about, a, they, I mean, I'll tell you all the time, atheists. There's no such thing as an atheist. There's not. It's always tells you the atheists, they're not atheists. They even know they're not atheists. 
Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 that from the visible things of the world, his Godhead is clearly seen so that they're without excuse. So we know there's no excuse for not knowing there's a God. But they're blinded by their stubbornness not to accept him. This speaks of the heart confronted with the truth, but which refuses to embrace the truth. Romans 1, 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in ungodliness. God says the wrath is coming for all those who blindly, stubbornly refuse to accept the truth. The word hold in that verse means to oppress. It speaks of those that hear the truth, know the truth, but refuse to acknowledge and embrace the truth. That's the world we live in today. Everyone knows that there's the truth, that there's a God. But they choose deliberately to reject it. Because of the stubbornness of their hearts, they are separated from the life that could be theirs. They remain trapped in the darkness, the depravity of their situation. And whether they like it or not, they are indeed lost in trespasses and sin, as in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Mankind did not merely get sick when Adam sinned. They died. You understand? Sin came upon all men and all men died. It was a death sentence. It was poison that was bitten into Adam's blood. And therefore, after that, that blood was poisoned. And the blood had to be purified. And man had no way of doing it did not have the cure. The venom was there. That's interesting that God used the snake. By the way, it wasn't the snake. It wasn't the snake that did it. It was Satan that did it through the serpent. The dead and depraved state, the lost live for nothing but to gratify the lust of the flesh. In this state, their understanding is darkened. It means the lost live in a continuous state of spiritual darkness and ignorance towards God. And since they are dead, they're unresponsive to the things of God. A person who's dead can't do anything. They can't respond. Satan wants to keep them asleep, keep them dead. They're like cold, immobile corpses which can neither see, hear, feel, nor think. They're dead because they are alienated from the life of God. They are unmoved by truth. They're unfazed by matters of right and wrong. They love the dark. They pursue the works of darkness. Watch our TV if you don't believe it. Any of our news channels show it over and over and over again. We're going to watch the DNC conference this week, many of us, because we just want to see the, the ridiculousness of it. And we're going to see uh, things paraded in front of us that are going to hopefully boil our blood because we see the hypocrisy and the things that are against God. And why do I know that? Because that's what their platforms is. I mean, I'm not saying anything that's political. I'm just saying the truth. Their platforms are totally against what we believe, what the Bible teaches. It's not about what I believe anyway. It's what the Bible teaches. Because we're saved, we'll be different. Our life with God defines us, empowers us. We're not dead to the truth. We love the truth. We long to live it out daily. We're not in darkness as the world is, but we walk in the light as He is in the light. John chapter 1 John 1 17. We're not like them, so we must not be we're not like them, so we must not be like them. Paul tells us the world has a problem with their head, with their hearts, but also with their hands. Not only do they have a problem with their heart, their head. Head leads to the heart. Heart leads to the hand's actions, doesn't it? Remember Jesus said that you can say you sin by committing adultery, and I say no, you sin by having lust. You can say I, you sin by killing somebody. No, I say you hated somebody first. came out of the heart. I can say you, you know, somebody is a murderer because they killed somebody. No, they hated somebody first. Somebody covetousness, they steal. Why? Because they coveted somebody first. See, the desires came from the heart first and then moved their way to the head. But in the end, it took action. And Paul says that here in verse 19. Who being past feelings have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Because they're lost were dead, they're said to be past feeling. The phrase means that they've lost their sense of pain. 
It means they're not bothered by their conscience, by the things that they do. They're like leopards. You know, a leopard has a disease and they don't know, they can't feel their, their, their extremities anymore. And so over time, they wear them out. They become nubs. They become disfigured because of their extremities. They, they have the ability to feel pain is taken away. And they don't know that they're being hurt, and so their, industry, their injuries fester and destroy their lives. Lost sinners commit his life to evil, and as he does, he loses his sensitivity towards sin. This leads them to ever-deepening levels of wickedness. Their lives yield to lasciviousness, which means wanton sensuality. How can I please myself? How can I get more about what I feel like? Why do you think the rampant drugs today? People want to feel better. People want to feel alive. People want to, don't want to feel the pain anymore of life. They want to have the depression that's going around. How many people you see on depression today? More than I've ever seen. Maybe it's because we're finally recognizing this possibility. Because we know we saw examples of it in the Old Testament. There's examples of people with depression. But I see more and more of it. All my many of our kids are diagnosed with learning disabilities now, attention deficits. Well, is it any wonder? It's an attitude that says, I will do what I please, when I please, with whom I please, and I don't care what anyone says or thinks about it. It's a life given over to open sin. The sinner works all uncleanness. The word work means to work hard, to take pains, to do your best at doing evil. The idea here is that the lost person works hard at sinning. They're past feelings and they don't care. They do all this with greediness, the Bible says. simply means he does what he does for self-gratification, not for other people. Sinful man is not his own God. He lives to worship himself. Or he is his own God. His worship of self involves gratifying all the base evil desires of the flesh and the mind. They give themselves over to the lust and their drive. That's what they do. We say our walk is new because it's different from the world. Now let's look at our walk is new because it is disconnected from the world. Verses 20 through 21 says, But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So while we're devoid being like the lost, we're supposed to strive to be like God. We're supposed to not be like the lost, but to be like Jesus. We're told that we, uh, having told us what we should not be, Paul now tells you what you should be. So he uses the first example to be what? To be like Christ. Verse 20, but ye have not learned Christ. You have not so learned Christ. The lost are motivated by their lust. And we're motivated by the Lord. Simple enough. The phrase learn Christ refers to being saved. We're learned Christ. We are saved. How do you know about Jesus? You accept Jesus. A lost person can't really understand Jesus, can they? They can't. They can't understand the Bible. Holy Spirit reveals himself to them. Remember, those who are studying in John, remember Jesus said, well, you don't understand all this, but... The helper's coming that'll help you understand it. Holy Spirit will come and he will tell you all things. So the only way we know about Jesus is because the only thing we can know is that we're sinners and we need a Savior. And then once we get saved, then God can tell you the rest. Jesus saved us, he changed us, he made us like himself. He delivered us from being like the world. We're no longer fulfilling the sins of the flesh. Our standard of living is Jesus as our example. When a person claims to know Jesus as Lord and Savior and still lives like the world, they're either deceiving themselves or they're liars. Look around. If you see people saying they're saved, but they're not living like saved, they ain't saved. You know? What do they say? Walk like a duck? Quack like a duck? You're probably a duck. I'm not a judge of people, but I can be a fruit inspector. The Bible does tell us to be good fruit inspectors. James 4.4 4 said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that your friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will not be a friend of the world is an enemy of God? 1 John 2, 3 and 6 says, 
Hereby you, we know that ye know him if ye keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Thereby know we that we are of him, and he that saith, he abideth him all himself also to walk, even as he walked. See, a Christian is going to walk like God tells him to walk. A born again believer strives to be like Jesus, walking in the way that the Bible teaches led by the Holy Spirit, producing a life that is vastly different than someone who's living in sin, results in a life that is pleasing to the Father, that emulates the Son. Philippians chapter 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. There's an illustration of a... a have you ever felt that society is whirling out of control? You know, I, don't you feel that same way when you watch TV? Uh, TV talk shows have sunk to the place where they have young teenagers that talk shamelessly about their sexual exports. Primetime comedy programs in the past would never even hint about a, have a hint of profanity today are full of profanity, vulgarity, sexual innuendos, and morality. There's a group known as the Media Research Center that monitors the so-called family hour and concluded the family hour decreasing respect for parental authority and traditional values has been troubling. Worst is the deterioration of standards has been the most noticeable in two areas, language and sexual content. Now, we may not be able to do much about TV broadcasting and TV programming, but we certainly can do something about our personal perspectives. We can take a look at what we're viewing, what our viewing habits are. We can evaluate whether we have become desensitized to what we hear. I'll be quite honest with you. i become desensitized to some things I hear, haven't you? Some things you used to hear, when you used to hear people use, still, I'll tell you, hair's back of my neck stands out when people use Jesus' name in vain. We didn't used to hear that. Today they have Jesus' name and then they throw in another foul word with it. You say, what are you doing? You, could, you, you, you think that's not enough? <laughs> Using Jesus' name? I officiate sports and I officiate basketball and I, for 33 years. I retired a couple years ago from doing it. But um, uh, I'm in a game with a guy and this uh, other official tees up a coach for using profanity. And he said, what? What did I say? He said, you said Jesus Christ. <laughs> he teed him up. He said, that's profanity. Because you use his name in vain. I thought, man, he's right. He is absolutely right. How can you argue with that, folks? That's profanity, isn't it? I think he kind of shocked the guy. <laughs> when Jesus came to us, he brought him knowledge and truth about him. That we, we, we can learn from God. We learn about God himself, the Holy Spirit, heaven and hell, sin and salvation, life and death, grace, faith and righteousness, eternity and judgment, the purpose of life and the meaning of life, creation, history, and everything else that matters, we learn from Jesus. We learn from the Word of God. The Bible is not a book of history, but when it talks about history, it is right. The book is not a book about, uh, a book about science, but when it talks about science, it's right. You know, it's amazing to me that more and more the people become more and more knowledgeable, the more and more they point back to the Bible being right. One example is, you know, life is in the blood. We knew that many years ago. When God wrote the book, he told us that life is in the blood, and man can't create blood. If they want to, they can't create blood. Why? Because life is in the blood, and only God can create life. Jesus taught us the truth. John 16, 13 said, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So we see the difference. We're to be different from the lost world around us. We're to be discerning and learn all that we can from the Lord Jesus. And now, though, finally, we want to look at the deliberate. We're to be our new walk. Where a new walk is because where it is a deliberate from the world. Ephesians 22 through 24 says, But that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt concerning the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and truth and holiness. So since we've been changed by the power of God, and since we've been taught by the truth of God, and now we're to be active in changing our lives. So we were, we were 
changed by the power of God. We're taught by the power of God. Now what are we supposed to do? Live by the power of God. Three actions that Paul mentions here. In verse 22, he talks about put off. In verse 23, he talks about renewed. And in verse 24, he says put on. These, by the way, are all action statements of fact. There is something to be put off, verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversations of the old man. The phrase put off means to strip away. It's the image of taking off your clothes. The old man is dirty, corrupt, filthy. He was stripped off when we are converted. The old things of our life is supposed to be taken away. We should not be continuing on in sin that we had before. Our lives should be different. Our clothes, we should be clothed with righteousness, not unrighteousness. The old man of sin remains alive and well within each of us, though, doesn't he? We have to fight those, sin, uh, those sins that are in our lives, those things that we have. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. We will want to do the things we always done, even after we're being saved. So hold on, God took that away from me. Praise God if he did, but most of us he didn't. But most of us he's given us the Spirit to help us fight it. Yeah, you know, I've heard people say, what about people that have homosexuals, that are homosexuals, that they don't act upon it. Can a homosexual that doesn't act upon homosexuality be saved? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Just like can a liar who doesn't lie be saved? Yes, they can. They don't practice lying anymore. But they still have that deceitfulness in them. They still have the, what about people who are an adulterer to get saved? Can they still, and they have lust, they lust after people. But can they they be saved? Sure, God can keep them from acting upon those sins that they battle with. What about drug addiction? People's alcoholics are always an alcoholic, right? Well, people battle with the sin of alcoholism. Are they now cured from it? Maybe not. Probably not. But they've got to fight against it. Holy Spirit helps them do that. They don't act upon it. See, the action, it calls it. They, have, they fight. The flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. The old nature is like a corpse rotting in the sun that grows more and more vile over time. The Romans used to do this where somebody was convicted of murder. What they would do is they would take the person that they killed and they would place the body of the victim on top of the murderer. They would stake the murderer to the ground and take the dead body and put them face to face with them and tie them on their body and walk away. And as that corpse rotted, the infection and all the other stuff rotted the person under the bottom. The murderer suffered miserably. Well, in a way... That's what we have to do. Our rotted body, we've got this rotted corpse. If we keep it face to face with us, it will infect us. We have to find a way to fight against it. The Holy Spirit can keep that. It can cleanse that away. We must be decisive each day and reckon on the old man dead to sin and by ourselves live to God. There is something to be, there is something to, uh, be renewed also in verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The lost sinner has a mind that's given over to vanity. Futility. The saint of God, on the other hand, is to walk with renewed mind. Part of the new life involves renewing the mind. How do you renew the mind? Getting in the Word. Constantly getting in the Word. The fact that God literally changed our minds when He saved us gives us the ability to live different lives. When our minds are set on things above and not on the things of the world, our lives follow the direction of the mind. We can never get our minds right then our lives will never be right. But if we can get our minds right, then our lives will be lived right. It's time our thinking, it is our thinking that either sets us up on the right path or puts us in the path of trouble. The mind of the lost will lead him every farther and farther away and the mind of the saved will lead him closer and closer to God and either deeper in holiness. We must be We must be decisive and take control. There is something to put on and is revealed in Ephesians 4.24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and trueness. Just as we were stripped of the old man, 
We're to put on the new man. The new holy man. I'm glad the air conditioning came on, by the way. Y'all think y'all hot out there. It's hotter up here, but he rises. He saved, he made us a new creature. It's a new creature. Paul says that the new man, which after God is created, the phrase literally means the new man was made in the likeness of God. See, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he marred the image of God in which he had been created, and he passed that sin and that warped nature down to his offspring. But when we were saved, we are recreated. Uh, we're now created in the image of him. We now have the ability. Before we're saved, we don't have the ability to do right. We only have the ability to do wrong. But once we're saved, we have the ability to do right. And we ought not to do wrong. The new man is literally Christ who lives in me. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, we're not perfect. And uh, we've been changed, but we're not perfect. We've been given all that we need to live our lives as best as possible, but we must actively yield ourselves every day to that walk. We must no longer walk in the rags of our sin. We must decisively put off the old man and put on the new man. So how is your walk today? Is it different from the world? Is, your, is it disconnected from the world? Is it deliberate from the world? Can you honestly say that you're living a life that is different from the world around you? If you were to tell people that you're a Christian, would they be surprised? Oh, I didn't know that. Or if someone says, hey, that person's a Christian. Oh, well, I figured that. <laughs> right? Don't you want somebody to figure that? Don't you want enough evidence when you stand before a judgment seat that they knew, yeah, 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 that's a Christian. Can you honestly say that your life displays Jesus as, your, as Jesus Christ of the world? If you're like me, then you need help with your mind. To place, and the place to find help is the Lord. If you're like me, you need help with your mind. If you're like me, you need help putting off that old man and putting on that new man. If you're like me, you need help with your actions to be driven to do what God wants you to do. And guess what? All of these things can be helped only through the Lord Jesus Christ, only through the Holy Spirit. Now, if today the Holy Spirit has revealed to you that you don't know Jesus as your Savior, that you don't know the Holy Spirit, that you're trapped in that old man, that you're like the world, then guess what? The place to find that help is with Jesus too. There's not a person in this room who does not need to talk to the Lord about the truth contained in this passage of Scripture. We all need to talk to God about putting off the old man and having the right walk with him today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity we have that we can come to you. I pray right now, Lord, you help us to evaluate our lives. Lord, if there's something that we need to talk to you about, the altar's open. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that don't know you as our Savior, that today be the day. Lord, I pray that whatever we do would be glorifying you. Help us, Lord, this week to walk in a way that's uplifting to you. For in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.